Hey there, another test review, this one on metabolism energy enzymes. Again, going to talk really fast, but pause, rewind, listen, really read your, your notes. And like we said, if there's something in your notes you don't understand, please ask me. A lot of you just write stuff down. You don't know what it's about. Uh, and since our test is free response, you're going to have to sort of understand how to apply uh, what's in your notes. Okay, so here we go. We started talking about alcohol and how your body's uh, metabolism uh, takes care of, of poisons that your, enter your body. And basically, metabolism is any reactions that occur in the body. And so we use this as an example that if someone drinks alcohol, their body has to take care of that poison. So most of that stuff takes place in the liver. So the alcohol in your blood ends up in your liver, and there you have an enzyme, an enzyme known as catalase. Enzyme's a protein. That means catalase is a protein. And basically what happens is it can metabolize or it can break down the ethanol into acetic acid. And so ethanol is toxic and acetic acid is non-toxic. And so your body can take care of it. And then we said years and years of this basically cause your liver cells to die, which decreases the amount of catalase working uh, and you can have liver disease. Now the enzyme lab, let's talk really quick about the enzyme lab. In the enzyme lab, we basically had six test tubes and they were fresh liver, frozen liver, boil, one in acid, one of them in a base, and one that was chopped. What am I, chopped liver? Anyway, so what we did was uh, we took some hydrogen peroxide and we put it in the first test tube and we got bubbles. That was the reaction. In the second one, now this may or may not happen for you, but this is sort of what typically should have happened in your lab. The first one gets uh, bubbles, and the frozen one gets maybe some bubbles, but not as much. Now boiled gets nothing. Acid base gets nothing. They get no bubbles. And basically the last one, the chopped one, gets lots of bubbles. And so if you analyzed correctly, basically uh, fresh... Um, that's where catalase is at its uh, optimum bubbling capacity. That means it's working the best at fresh. In frozen, you do get some reaction, but it should have been a little slower because the enzymes are not at their optimal temperature. They're a little colder, so they're moving slower. So there's less of a reaction. In the boiled, the enzymes do nothing because they are completely deformed. They are denatured. They change their shape. The boiling changed their shape. Acid and base, those were the two extremes who basically sort of messed up the acids as well. They're all denatured and broken and, and probably, you know, disintegrated. But acid eats up things and bases do the same. Um, and then chopped got tons of bubbles. I mean, some people's bubbles went all the way to the top of the test tube. And the reason for this was if you chop up the liver, you actually are exposing more catalase. So you increase the surface area of the liver, it'll increase the amount of catalase working. So that's why all the bubbles went up because tons of, it was like a catalase party. Okay, now the second part of the lab, not the second part, there was this experiment where when you did the first one with fresh, right? You had fresh liver in the first test tube and you put hydrogen peroxide in there and what happened? Well, you got bubbles, right? but also there was a liquid left over that was made. You had to sort of understand what the whole point of this was. Catalase is actually metabolizing. That means it's doing a chemical reaction. And I wrote the reaction here at the bottom. Hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, gets converted into water and oxygen. So the whole point was the bubbles were a gas being made. And so the gas being made was, well, look at the formula. The formula was O2, that's the gas. So the bubbles were oxygen. And then the lab told you, hey, take that leftover water and put it in a new test tube. Yeah, sorry, I didn't say water. It said like mystery liquid, like you had to figure out what the liquid was. So what did you do then? Well, how did you test what it was? Well, if you dunk that same liver or even a fresh piece of liver, I think the lab said a fresh piece of liver, it doesn't matter. But if you put another liver in there, what happens? Well, nothing happens because it turns out that that liquid was what? It was just water. Again, look at the formula, water and oxygen. Now, we didn't run this experiment, but what if you took that liver again and put it in a new test tube and put hydrogen peroxide back in there? Do you think you know what will happen? Hmm? Do ya? Hmm? Well, it turns out that if you put 
hydrogen peroxide back in there, you'll get bubbles and you'll get more water. Because, why does that happen? Well, it happens because the catalase doesn't get deformed. The catalase can work over and over and over again. Um, okay, cool. We then talked about energy, and we said the first law of thermodynamics is that uh, energy cannot be created nor destroyed. And we basically said energy can, chant, can go through one form to another. So the famous examples are potential to kinetic. That's where if you take a rock and lift it up over someone's head, but don't move and don't drop it, that's potential energy. If you drop the rock, it has kinetic energy, and so it's moving and it hits someone in the head and it makes heat and it makes a sound and they punch you in the face. But anyway, that's energy transferring from one form to another. Um, we said that uh, shivering, that's why there's a picture of that dude there, um, shivering is a form of mechanical or kinetic energy making heat. And so your muscles can actually warm up from shivering. We said energy in an ecosystem travels from the sun. That's solar energy or light energy. And basically it reaches the producers. And then it goes into the consumers. And there's different kinds of consumers. Like primary consumers eat grass. Like a cow is a primary consumer. Secondary consumers, they eat herbivores. Um, and then you also have secondary consumers and tertiary consumers, uh, which go up the food chain. Basically, decomposers uh, transfer the energy from anything that's dead and put it back into the soil. And so the circle of life continues. But just know that energy goes, when it goes up the food chain from plants to cow to snake, because, yeah, a snake eats a cow. But anyway, as the energy gets transferred, there's actually less and less energy as you move through the food chain. Only 10% gets to the next uh, uh organism in the food chain. And we said the reason is because each organism uses 90% of the energy they get from food for metabolism. Only 10% of that energy gets transferred over. One example we talked about a little bit were whales. Um, we may have talked about that, but um, whales are awesome at eating very low on the food chain. They're so huge, they actually feed on krill, which are tiny, tiny little shrimp, but are packed pound for pound with energy. We then watched a little video, remember, with the crazy guy, um, and he used firewood as an analogy, talked about activation energy, what's a catalyst, ripping paper, and scissor blades analogy. So fi he talked about firewood because that has stored energy in it, and to get the firewood to actually release its energy, you have to put energy in it. That was what he was talking about. The energy you need to put into that firewood is called activation energy. A catalyst is anything that speeds that up because that takes so long to get that activation energy in there. Um, ripping paper, again, stuff doesn't happen naturally. Ripping paper was really, really, really hard. So the analogy was the ripping paper was hard without help. And the help was the enzyme, scissor. But he said also a specific part of the enzyme is what rips the paper, or the specific part of the enzyme is what works on a substrate. And so the scissor blades are what cut the paper, but you couldn't cut the paper with like the back of the scissors or whatever, okay? So activation energy, the amount of energy, energy needed for a reaction to occur. We saw a little video on nitroglycerin, wood versus nitroglycerin. The whole point was wood has a higher activation energy than nitroglycerin. Wood needs a lot of energy to get it going. But nitroglycerin, all, only a hammer, like the movie showed a hammer slamming onto a drop of nitroglycerin and it exploded. So that's what this looks like. Basically, you start with reactants, the stuff in the beginning. You put energy into the system till you reach a dotted line. And then the energy is released or drops. Okay, those are the products. And that's called activation energy. There's two types of reactions you can have. If you're the energy that ends up in the products is less than the beginning, that's an exothermic reaction, a reaction that releases heat or releases energy. But if you notice the one on the right, that graph, the products actually are higher than the reactants. That means energy was put into the system. When do they happen? Well, really the second one happens when we're building things in our body. We actually have to expend ATP energy to build something larger, like a protein or something. And uh, exothermic is stuff like burning and things like that, stuff that releases tons of energy. Enzymes, the whole point about talking about enzymes is they lower the activa activation energy of reactions. 
So in this example, um, substrate is the thing that's either being digested. Here in this example, maltose is being uh, digested into glucose because maltose is glucose. And the way that it happens is the maltose lands in the active site, which is the, the shape. Remember, enzymes are shape specific. The substrate lands in the active site, and this can happen over and over again. One thing we also talked about was that enzymes don't perfectly fit. They used to think they were like lock and key, uh, but it turns out that the enzymes kind of change their shape to wrap around or induced fit, have an induced fit around the substrate. Here's a little graph that shows you what enzymes they're all about, and they're all about having activation energy lowered. Okay. So. Remember, enzymes are proteins, which means they're made up of amino acids. Don't be tricked by that. They're substrate specific. That means you can't use lactose, sorry, you can't use lactase on a piece of amylo, uh, amylase. That means it's only lactase can only break up lactose. And they're not changed or consumed in the reaction unless we like heat them up or something, and then they get all denatured. Now let's talk about that substrate because this was um, on our practice review sheet. But in a reaction without enzymes, the substrates, look at substrate, the substance A and B, basically they will float around and will hook up without enzymes, no problem. The thing is it reacts so slow because A and B need to be sort of facing each other in the proper orientation. That means they need to be in the right direction for them to hook up or bond. What enzyme is awesome with is it can actually hold one on one one like A, and then it can look for B, and it can hook them up and put them in the right direction, and bam, you got your product, AB, um, thousands and thousands of times per second. So proper orientation of the substrate is very important, and it's why reactions happen faster with enzymes. So, Enzyme Hall of Fame, here we go. We said that we have enzymes and location and function. So now these catalase, is in your liver, removes toxins. Amylase is in your saliva, breaks down starch. Pepsin, it's in your stomach and breaks down peptides. Don't worry so much about the other one, uh, protein one. We're gonna use pepsin on our test, not protease. And lipase breaks up fats, okay? And it's in our digestive juice. And ligase, helicase, those are DNA glues. Uh, ligase is the DNA glue. Helicase is the one that unzips DNA. And last, inhibitors. Uh, sometimes enzymes need to be controlled either by your body or some kind of poison or something, some kind of medicine makes the enzyme stop working. Those are called inhibitors. There's two types of inhibitors. One of them sort of lands in the active site and gets in the way. That's a competitive inhibitor because it's competing for the active site. And the non-competitive inhibitor sort of goes into like a little secondary active site on the back, you see? It's like getting in the way there, and it changes the shape of the enzyme so the substrate can't fit in. And so that's a non-competitive inhibitor. Examples of this in nature, poisons can actually affect the enzymes that work in your nervous system. And so your nervous system starts to shut off because the poison um, inhibits your enzymes. And then our medicines like antibiotics, a lot of uh, the, the antibiotics we make um, uh, prevent the bacteria's enzymes from working by inhibiting them. Okay. Oh, there's more. <laughs> so factors that affect the rate of enzyme activity. The first thing is the amount of substrate. So basically, the more substrate molecules you put into a reaction, the more they'll be colliding with enzymes. So more product is going to form until it reaches a certain amount. So be ready to draw this graph. I'm going to sort of give you a blank graph and, and label it substrate concentration at the bottom reaction rate. So that's basically what you need to know. Make sure you make the line go up and then go straight because the reaction sort of levels off. There's only so, so they, they reach like a, a certain limit that they can work. Same with amount of enzyme, it's the same graph. Line goes up and straight. The more enzymes, the more they'll be working uh, on the substrate, so they go faster and faster, faster, but there is a limit, so it's it levels off. Temperature, temperature is a hump like this. It's a gradual hump on the left, and it's usually a direct straight dive on the right. The reason being is that the cold usually kind of slows them down and the heat makes them just die at a certain point, okay? So this is the optimum temperature is that line. We said fevers can be uh, dangerous because um, the enzymes become denatured. 
and denatured is, is where they change their shape and they can't fit into the active site. Okay. And last but not least, pH. The pH scale works from 0 to 14, where 7 is in the middle. 7 is water, very neutral, very safe to drink. Um, as you move to the right on the pH scale towards the 14, you have your bases. And when you move to the left from the 7, you have your acids. The whole point of this, if you look at the graph at the bottom left, you'll have to know this graph, by the way, two of those things. If I say, hey, show me the pH of like what saliva amylase would look like. Well, it's our saliva, so it's very neutral. If you notice the hump on amylase, which is the red one, it's basically near 7 because your saliva is not as very acidic. Um, so it's a very big hump at 7. And pepsin, which is in your stomach, pepsin likes acid, so put a big hump at 2. So remember those two, 2 and 7. Don't worry about that other purple one. All right, so that's good. Good luck. If you need help, I'll be around tomorrow. See you guys.